Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Burns from the Harp Center for Catholic Thought and Culture here at the University of San Diego. And I would like to welcome you all here tonight. I would like to start with some bad news for the uh, bishop, but the CARA's latest report said that according to a 2019 Pew Research Center survey, U.S. adults are resoundingly clear in their belief that religious institutions should stay out of politics. <laughs> Nearly two-thirds of Americans in the new survey say churches and other houses of worship should keep out of political matters, while 36% say they should express their views on day-to-day -day social and political questions. Well, be that as it may, Bishop McElroy is going to speak tonight on candidates, consciences, and faithful voting. I'm really pleased to welcome Bishop McElroy here. As you probably all know, he's a very well-educated man, has degrees from Harvard, Stanford, the Gregorian in Rome. He's published books and articles. But for me, the most important thing about Bishop McElroy is that he is our pastor, and he's a very pastoral man who cares deeply about the people of San Diego and through the United States. So welcome, Bishop. You know, it's an interesting thing on the question uh, Jeff was mentioning about politics, because I often find people say to me, um, they'll espouse some strong political opinion they think the church should be advocating very specifically and strongly. And then, then when I point out something else that may be on the other partisan divide, they'll say, oh, but that's politics. <laughs> So how people divide uh, and uh, conceptualize the church and politics is very important. And uh, just so you know our basic stance, um, uh, people come up to me now and they say, D do you know the Johnson am Amendment was repealed? So now the church can ha get up in the pulpit, the priest can be directed. You can direct them to go up and advocate for a particular candidate for any office. And I say, I know, but we still can't do that as Catholics. That's not our role. And that isn't our role. That's not what we do. In this country, the church does not endorse particular candidates. That has been our tradition. It remains our tradition. During every election, and I'm sure I will have this happen this time, I, I, I will get something during the week and people will say, Father X, uh, uh, was in the pulpit last week endorsing, well, last time was Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, okay? And so I had had two who were endorsing Donald Trump. So I had to call them up and say, knock it off, you know? And then I was very pleased because the following week somebody got up and endorsed Hillary Clinton. So at least I was able to be even handed and call him up and say, you got to knock it off too. Because that is our stance. We And that's, the whole theme of what I'm going to speak about today is precisely the church not telling people what candidate to vote for. Because our role is conscience formation. That's all it is. It's your conscience. And in the end, you make the decision. And in our faith, that's what you are called to do. You are the citizen. You are the voter. You are the believer. And it's in your heart and soul and in your conscience you are called to make the gospel manifest in the world in which we live. The church has certain teachings about what's important and how we try to enflesh the gospel. But as, as I'll be saying tonight, the selection of specific candidates is a very intricate thing that involves a variety of decisions. You know, the ballot, my ballot came today. How many of you have gotten your ballot so far? Okay. And that's kind of why I picked this time frame to do this, because it's when people start to think about who they're going to vote for. And I'll have to say, uh, I don't know my way of doing is right. There are certain candidates I have very specific ideas about, and then other candidates in the ballot for certain positions. I know a bit about, and then some I don't know much about. 
So those I skip. What, what do you all do? I just want to take a poll. Do many of you skip some of the candidates for a variety of positions that you don't know anything? I mean, raise your hand if you. That's what I do. I figure I don't know, so I'm not going to. It's not, you know, like when you take those um, multiple choice tests, and there's some, some which give you benefit if you fill them all in even randomly, and some don't. But I figure I, so I don't do those anymore. But what I'm going to talk about today is really those contests <clears throat> which are important to us and how the church indicates for us we should begin to wrestle with our consciences and what should be taken into account. And partly I'm going to be addressing some of the things that I think are, uh, um, are not representative of, of, of authentic Catholic teaching that are in the atmosphere and portrayed as Catholic. So the, the, the title of the talk is <coughs> Conscience, Candidates, and Discipleship in Voting. In Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis points powerfully to the vocation of faith-filled citizenship. He says, an authentic faith always involves a deep desire to change the world to transmit values, to leave the world somehow better than we found it. We love this magnificent planet on which God has put us. And we love the human family which dwells here, with all of its tragedies and struggles, its hopes and aspirations, its strengths and weaknesses. The earth is our common home, and all of us our brothers and sisters. If indeed the just ordering of society and the state is a central responsibility of politics, the church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. It is primarily through the votes of Catholic women and men, rooted in conscience and in faith, that the church enters into the just ordering of society and the state. And I emphasize that again. It is through the consciences of women and men as voters, making the choices they make in conscience and in faith, that the church enters primarily into the political realm, not through the structures of the church, notice. And it is primarily in voting for specific candidates for office that believers and citizens have the greatest opportunity to leave the earth better than we found it. Yet comparatively little attention has been paid in Catholic moral theology to the moral nature and structure of the act of voting for specific candidates. Much focus is placed on individual policy issues and their moral implications in Catholic social teaching. And if the primary role of citizens were vote, to vote on specific issues, this might be sufficient. But a vote for individual candidates inevitably encapsulates a wide variety of policy options reaching out into the future, as well as varying capacities and intentions among the candidates. Where does Catholic theology begin in assisting believers to carry out their role in ennobling the world. Pope Francis answers this question by proposing starkly that our political lives must be seen as an essential element of our personal call to holiness. This certainly means that our political actions must reflect and flow from our Catholic faith. But Francis is demanding much more. He proposes that we can only fulfill our vocation as faithful citizens if we come to see in the very toxicity of our political culture at this moment a call for deeper conversion to Jesus Christ. It is not enough for us to ignore the corrosive elements of political life in the United States, <clears throat> nor even to navigate our role as citizens and voters without succumbing to the tribalism that bisects our society. We are called in our lives as citizens and believers 
to be missionaries of dialogue and civility in a moment that values neither. And this requires deep spiritual reflection, courage, and judgment. It demands a Christ-like dedication to seeking the truth no matter where it may lead and defining our politics and voting in light of the gospel. In this task, the principles of Catholic social teaching as they are applied to the core political issues of American society today provide a rich and sacred source of guidance in weighing the policy proposals of competing candidates. The comprehensiveness of Catholic social teaching points toward an understanding of justice, life, and peace that refuses to be confined to narrow boxes or relegated to partisan categories. At the same time, this very comprehensiveness makes the prioritization of Catholic teachings difficult for voters. As the 2020 election cycle begins, at least 10 salient goals emerge from the gospel in the long tradition of Catholic faith. Number one, the promotion of a culture and legal structures that protect the life of unborn children. Two, the reversal of the climate change that threatens the future of humanity and particularly devastates the poor and the marginalized. Three, policies that safeguard the rights of immigrants and refugees in a moment of grave intolerance. Four, laws that protect the aged, the ill, and the disabled from the lure and scourge of euthanasia and assisted suicide. Five, vigorous opposition to racism in every form, both through cultural transformation and new legal structures. Six, the provision of work and the protection of workers' rights across America. Seven, systematic efforts to fight poverty and egregious inequalities of wealth. Eight, policies that promote marriage and family, which are so essential for society. Nine, substantial movement toward universal nuclear disarmament. And 10, the protection of religious liberty. Now I mentioned those not in the order that they are, that's not a prioritization, but to give an overview of the breadth of the issues in Catholic social teaching, which are very, very important, and which the church brings to the center of our gaze as we begin to struggle with those ballots we've got in front of us and what's going on in our society today. And you can see how broad it is and how important those issues are, but also it's hard to know how you prioritize those things. Frequently in discussions of the application of Catholic social teaching and voting, the question is raised whether one issue has a unique priority among all the other issues in its claim upon believers in the current election cycle. Some have categorized abortion in that way, others climate change. This question deserves deeper scrutiny. More than 750,000 unborn children are directly killed in the United States every year. At one time, there was a bipartisan support for erecting policies that made abortion rare. Now that commitment has been eviscerated in the Democratic Party in a capitulation to notions of privacy that simply block out the human identity and rights of unborn children. Even in an age when sonograms testify with the elegance, eloquence of truth and life itself, the children in the womb are genuinely our brothers and sisters, our daughters and sons. The annihilation of their humanity in perception and in fact continues. Catholic social teaching has consistently demanded that there be legal protections for the unborn as they are the most vulnerable and victimized of humanity. We are rapidly moving toward becoming a nation split in two, with half of our country moving toward laws safeguarding the unborn and the other half adopting ever more extreme laws 
that allowed the killing of children on the verge of birth. The passage of the New York abortion law this past year was a marker of America's repudiation of the most basic principles of human life. It is for all these reasons that many in the church consider abortion to be the preeminent political imperative at stake in 2020. At the same time, there is clear international scientific consensus that climate change caused by fossil fuels and other human activities poses an existential threat to the very future of humanity, and that air pollution resulting from fossil fuels is already a major cause of premature death on our planet. Existing trajectories of pollutants being placed in the atmosphere by human activity, if unchecked, will raise the temperature of the earth in the coming decades, generating catastrophic rises in human exposure to deadly heat, as well as exposure to a series of perilous viruses. In addition, there will be severe widespread famines, droughts, and massive dislocations of people that will cause uncalled deaths, human suffering, and violent conflict. The devastating fires in Australia are a sign of what lies before us and a testimony that on so many levels, our current position, pollution of the earth is stealing the future from coming generations. Because the trajectory of danger unleashed by fossil fuels is increasing so rapidly, the next 10 years are critical to staunching the threat to our planet. The United States, which was once a leader in this effort, has in the current administration become the leader in resisting efforts to combat climate change and in denying its existence. As a consequence, the survival of the planet, which is the prerequisite for all human life, is at risk. Against the backdrop of these two monumental threats to human life, how can one evaluate the competing claims that either abortion or climate change should be uniquely preeminent in Catholic social teaching regarding the formation of Americans as citizens and believers at this moment. Four points should be considered. One, there is no mandate in universal Catholic social teaching that gives a categorical priority to either of these issues as uniquely determinative of the common good. Number two, the death toll from abortion is more immediate but the long-term death toll from unchecked climate change is larger and threatens the very future of humanity. Three, both abortion and the environment are core life issues in Catholic teaching. Four, the designation of either of these issues as the preeminent question in Catholic social teaching at this time in our country will inevitably be hijacked by partisan forces to propose that Catholics have an overriding duty to vote for candidates that espouse that position. Recent electoral history shows this to be a certainty. The question of preeminence is further clouded by a third compelling issue our country faces in this election cycle. The culture of exclusion that has grown so dramatically in our nation during the last three years. Racial injustice is on the rise, buttressed by a new language and symbolism that seeks to advance the evil of white nationalism and create structures of racial prejudice for a new generation. Immigrants and refugees who have been at the core of America's history as a source of vitality and richness are portrayed as a cause for fear and suspicion in our society rather than of solidarity. Members of the Muslim community are widely characterized as aliens whose religion automatically means that they cannot be trusted, while incidents of vile and pervasive anti-Semitism are on the rise. This growing culture of exclusion does not emerge as a specific policy question in our national politics, 
Rather, it seeps into all the most salient questions of life and dignity that our society faces and corrodes each one in turn. The culture of exclusion has unleashed a poison of animosity toward immigrants that paralyzes our politics so deeply that we cannot even find a pathway to protect young men and women who came to this nation as children and now thirst to be citizens of the only land they have ever known. The deadly imprint of racist structures and legacies on our criminal justice system magnifies fears and resentments against African American and Hispanic families and further imperils the men and women who give their lives to law enforcement. Racial and ethnic disparities in education, health, job availability, and housing, which are rooted in our nation's historic culture of exclusion, dramatically propel the breakdown of marriage and family life. And inequalities of wealth and income make it all but impossible to overcome the enduring challenges of work and poverty in the United States. On virtually every question of human life and dignity, this growing culture of exclusion in our nation reinforces and propels cleavages that are highly destructive to all of the goals that lie at the center of Catholic social teaching. For this reason, many faith-filled Catholics believe that in this election cycle, the most compelling issue that arises from Catholic social teaching for American voters is the need to repudiate radically this culture of exclusion before it spreads further and leads to new levels of moral analysis, paralysis, and division. Seen against this background of abortion, climate change, and the culture of exclusion, it is clear that the faith-filled voter who seeks to be guided by Catholic social teaching is confronted by moral claims that are compelling and that cut across the partisan and cultural divides of our country. The pathway from these cross-cutting moral claims to decisions on particular candidates is not a direct and singular one in Catholic teaching, rooted in one issue. For this reason, the drive to label a single issue preeminent distorts the call to authentic discipleship in voting rather than enhancing that discipleship. In America today, a faith-filled voter is called to approach voting from a stance of bridge building and healing from our nation. Such a voter is also called to integrate into his voting decisions the major salient elements of Catholic teaching to touch upon the political issues of our day, which I have just discussed. Understanding that these teachings vary in priority and claim, but are united in their orientation to the common good. But voting for candidates ultimately involves choosing a candidate for public office, not a stance nor a specific teaching of the church. And for this reason, faithful voting involves careful consideration of the specific ability of a particular candidate to actually advance the common good. In making this assessment, opportunity, competence, and character all come into play. The question of opportunity is pivotal in voting discipleship. What are the elements of human life and dignity that the specific candidate in that office will be able to advance given the scope of the office he is, she is seeking, the crucial issues that are likely to face her during her term, and the policy questions and positions she embraces. What coalitions will she be likely to join and help advance? In short, what capacity will she have in office in the specific political context she will face to transform law and public policy in key sectors in order to promote the common good. Competence is also a central met metric for faith-filled voters to consider. It does little good to elect a saint who echoes Catholic social teaching on every issue if that candidate does not have the competence 
to carry out his duties effectively and thereby enhance the common good. Faith-filled voters must assess the intelligence, human relations skills, mastery of policy, and intuitive insights that each candidate brings to bear. For voting discipleship seeks results, not merely aspirations. Finally, because our nation is in a moment of political division and degradation in public life, character represents a particularly compelling criterion for faithful voting in 2020. In the United States, political leaders imprint their character in pivotal ways upon the entire political culture and thus on society itself. Today, leaders in government embrace corrosive tactics and language fostering division rather than unity. The notion of truth itself has lost its footing in our public debate. Collegiality has been discarded. Principles are merely justifications for partisan actions. To be abandoned when these principles no longer favor a partisan advantage. There is a fundamental lack of political courage in the land. For all these reasons, Character is an even more essential element in effective faith-filled voting at the present moment, and another reason why faith-filled voting simply cannot be reduced to a series of competing social justice teachings. In the end, it is the candidate who is on the ballot, not a specific issue. The faith-filled voter is asked to make the complex judgment. Which candidate will be likely to best advance the common good through his office in the particular political context he will face. Such a decision embraces the planes of principle and character, competence and capacity. And for the faithful voter, the very complexity of this moral judgment demands a recourse to the voice of God, which lies deep within each of us, our conscience. For the disciple of Jesus Christ, voting is a sacred action. In the words of the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, it touches the crossroads where Christian life and conscience come into contact with the real world. For this reason, it cannot be reduced to a logical set of propositions that yield a predetermined result in the selection of candidates. Some theologians have sought to find such a logic of deduction in the concept of intrinsic evil. Catholic theology holds that some actions, such as abortion or research on human embryos, are intrinsically evil. That is, they are always and everywhere wrong as actions. Because of this, some Catholic leaders have asserted that candidates who seek laws opposing intrinsically evil actions automatically have a primary claim to political support in the Catholic conscience. The problem with this approach is that while the criterion of intrinsic evil identifies specific acts which are always and everywhere wrong, this criterion is not a measure of the relative gravity of the evil in particular acts, human acts or political acts. Telling a lie is intrinsically evil while well, escalating a nuclear arms race is not. But it's wrong-headed to propose that telling a lie to constituents should count more in the calculus of faithful voting than a candidate's intention to initiate a destabilizing nuclear weapons program. Similarly, contraception is intrinsically evil in Catholic moral theology while well, actions which destroy the environment generally are not. But it's a far greater moral evil for our country to abandon the Paris Climate Accord than to provide contraceptives in federal health care centers. What these examples point out is that Catholic social teaching cannot be reduced to a deductivist model when it comes to voting to safeguard the life and dignity of the human person. Intrinsic evil has no place in Catholic voting discernment. How then does the faithful voter choose candidates in a way that integrates the tenets of Catholic social teaching 
recognizes the role that competence, character, and capacity play in real world of governing, and preserves the stance of building unity within society. The church locates this pathway in the virtue of prudence. In the words of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. It is prudence that immediately guides the judgment of conscience. In Catholic social teaching, prudence is called the charioteer of the virtues. This is one of my favorite sections of the catechism. It's the charioteer of the virtues. You know, all the virtues we're called to have in our Christian life, hope, love, mercy, compassion, integrity, all these different ones. Um, any one of them could be taken to extreme. Can someone be too honest? Yes. Can, can, can someone be too courageous so it's foolhardy? Yes. All of the virtues are meant to be exercised together, and it's prudence which brings them together to, within our hearts and souls, give us a balanced outlook which brings together all of the Christian virtues and allows us to see the right way to proceed. So it is with, with voting. It is the charioteer of the virtues prudence. It brings into balance all the virtues of the Christian moral life to provide a singularly incisive moral perspective for the disciple confronting ethically complex problems. It lies at the heart of the workings of conscience. Some Catholic commentators on voting have in recent years portrayed prudential judgment as having a deficient dignity and grasp of the truth. They say there's a categorical claim to support candidates who legislatively oppose intrinsic evils, but only a secondary claim for candidates whose proposals rest on prudential judgment for their moral discernment. To say this is to miss the central element of Catholic teaching about conscience and prudence. It misses the central element. As the Catechism notes, quote, with the help of prudence, we apply moral principles to particular cases without error and overcome doubts about the good to achieve and the evil to be avoided, unquote. Prudential judgment is not a secondary or deficient mode of discernment in the Catholic conscience. It is the primary mode. When you all sit down with your ballot and try to figure out for the offices you consider most important, which candidate you should choose, and all these compelling, important things that you've got to bring into play, it is prudence in conscience which allows you to weigh them and come to the conclusion, this is the right person. Prudential judgment is not a secondary or deficient mode of discernment in the Christian conscience. It is the primary mode. This is certainly true in voting for candidates for public office. The constellation of substantial moral elements that are relevant to deciding which candidate is most likely to advance the common good during her time in office can only be morally comprehended through the virtue of prudence. There cannot be faith-filled Catholic voting without the virtue of prudence, exercised within the sanctity of well-formed conscience. In the closing remarks of his address to Congress in 2015, Pope Francis said, a nation is great when it defends liberty as Abraham Lincoln did, when it seeks equality as Martin Luther King did, and when it strives for justice for the oppressed as Dorothy Day did. Let us pray that our nation moves towards such greatness in this election year and that faith-filled, prudent disciples are leading the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bishop. So Bishop McElroy has agreed to entertain some questions. And Aaron Bishop, the director of our Office of Mission, will give some guidelines. So in order to have a meaningful and productive dialogue this evening, here are some guidelines for our conversation. 
we do have limited time and need to conclude our programming by 5 p.m. So you're welcome to make a comment uh, you would like for the bishop to hear or ask a question. And because of the limited time, and in order to get to as many themes as possible, we ask that you please limit your time to one minute. Both Dr. Burns and I will have microphones available in different um, sections of the theater, and we'll rotate taking comments from the audience. Please just simply raise your hand for us to come to you. We ask that if you're seated in the middle of a row, you come to the end of the row so that we can assist you with the microphone. We expect the conversation to remain respective and civil. We um, implore you to exhibit the character of faithful voters, voters that the bishop has spoken about. If individuals are disruptive or prevent the conversation, they will be removed. Thank you in advance for your cooperation and thank you to our public safety team who will help us enforce these guidelines. And again, we will conclude the program by 5 p.m. Bishop McElroy, I'm Emily Reamer Berry yes. in Theology and Religious Studies. I want to start by thanking you. Uh, thank you for coming to USD, sure. and I hope that this becomes a, a regular event. We really enjoy having you here. Um, my uh, affirmation or, or appreciation of your talk is um, that I really appreciate that you gave attention to at least 10 issues from Catholic social thought um, that need to be given serious consideration in our discernment, and I think we don't often hear enough about you know, more than one issue, so I do really appreciate that. My question is, is proportionalism making a comeback? I heard in your talk that you were imploring us to weigh values and disvalues, to recognize moral complexity and moral ambiguity, and I'm wondering if you think proportionalism is making a comeback in our conscientious discernment. Thank you. Well, I think, when you vote, you're trying to take into account, as I mentioned, this is a very complex reality when you vote. We, we sit down and vote for one person, but what we're really doing is we're bringing all these things into play. What is that person stands on A, B, C, D issues we consider important morally? What are the opportunities they will have to advance those? What are the skills of that person? What is their character? All these things we're trying to come into one choice, which is, which person do we choose? And so there's a proportionalism that comes into play in that choice by its nature. There's, there's no one person that leaps out that's going to satisfy, sadly, even two-thirds of those things. It's not going to happen. So we have to tr trade off which issues do we consider most important to advance at this time and which candidate is going to do that. Now, I wouldn't particularly use the word proportionalism for that. What I would use is, it is a complex choice in which many different dimensions come into play if we're going to do this well. Now, I have to say, I emphasize all this complexity. But in the end, you know, uh, we know there are certain people who can get so wound up in complexity of things they don't make a choice. You've got to come and make a choice. And so it's not like you could spend the next, well, between now and March, pouring over your ballot and weighing all these things. You've got to look at it, say, what do you think is important given your faith, given the gospel? What issues are important? What do I know about this person or that person that will lead me to believe they would do this? Which ones will they help advance? And then say, okay, I'm going this one, I'm going that one. So there are just many, it's a choice question. What I want to emphasize, you're choosing a candidate, and all these other factors come into play, and you've got to weigh that as best you can. So I think I wouldn't use the proportions language as much as I would use the, it's a complex choice. Like we have many, you know, in our lives, there are many complex choices. Important moral choices that come to us are often complex. You know, how do you care for a you know, a parent who's ill or a child that's ill, how do you make trade-offs in your family, you know, priorities and budget as to how you're gonna help people? These are complicated things. Every important moral issue is complicated. This one is too, and this is, the teachings are meant to help guide us and come to a conclusion on that. Whoops. Bishop McElroy, Aaron Bianco. Oh, hi, Aaron. 
My question is, within the last three years and even before, we've lost all civility in this country. The right attacks the left, the left attacks the right. It happens within families, communities, and even amongst the Catholic bishops. Do you believe that there's a way back to what we used to know as being civil within our politics in this country? I do, only yesterday was my birthday, and I'm 66. So be, be, well, I mentioned that only because uh, it, it gives me a perspective that gives me great consolation in these days. I was uh, 14 years old in 1968. That was a turbulent year. The whole culture seemed to be coming apart. And it was one of those years like 1815, 1848, 1917, where around the world societies were falling apart. And I felt more, and even looking back historically, I feel that was more of a disintegration than we have now. Now, some of our institutions were stronger, that which was of help, but the culture itself was just collapsing, and yet we came back to levels of civility and consensus and so forth. So I do think we will do that. I, I want to just give you an example of what I think is, this has been going on for some time. We just went through an impeachment, and I would just say to you, the very same people who were for impeachment last time were against it this time, and the people who were against it last time were for it this time. Principles don't exist. Partisanship exists. That's a catastrophic development in our society, and the, and the lack of the, the relativism that's come on for so long. Those are catastrophic. But I do think, yes, I, I'm, I'm hope-filled on this. Okay. Hello. Uh, thanks for my, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'll, you mentioned that there's n that there's no specific uh, teaching saying that there, you should vote for a certain issue or something like that. But uh, there's a lot of confusion over uh, Joe Biden, who was denied communion for for uh, his positions on abortion. Yet no one else has been denied communion for like positions on climate change or racism or anything like that. So I, I would like to ask about that. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I hate, hate to say this. in 2004 when Kerry was it. 2004 when Kerry ran. I wrote an article arguing in America that I didn't think communion should be used in this way, the Eucharist should be used in this way. And there were several reasons. It puts the church right in the middle of the debate. It makes the Eucharist a weapon. It, it, it attaches the Eucharist to a partisan stance. So for all those reasons, some, I was just at the Vatican, we had our at Limina visit, every so many years the bishops go to Rome, be with the Pope and the different departments. So we just got back last week, the region, the California bishops were there. And uh, so this question came up, you know, it's not Catholic teaching that there's an obligation to withhold on this, okay? It's not the way we do things, okay? There is a question about if, if people are doing certain particularly grievous sins, okay? Then you meet, you sit down, you meet with them. You know, we do this one-on-one -on -one sometimes in a parish, but it's not meant to be a political symbol or uh, particularly the Eucharist is not meant to be a sign of our political division. To me, if, if we go down that route, and there's some who will take us down that route, because unfortunately it's very decentralized. You notice that in the, in the Biden case, it was a particular priest in maybe South Carolina or somewhere in Carolina uh, when he was there campaigning, who just withheld communion. So, so everybody gets to decide themselves on this, or a Eucharistic ministry can decide. But in my view, it is not good to weaponize it, to, par to make the mass a partisan exercise, which that does. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bishop McElroy for sure. presenting to us. I appreciate that. Um, there, we, we live in California, so there are a lot of issues in California that we're faced with. For the last several years, we have been dominated by one party. I am most concerned about laws that are sexualizing our children and being, doc and they're being indoctrinated in public schools. Pla Planned Parenthood has been 
coming into school districts and setting up offices. We can talk about climate change, we can talk about abortion, there's a lot of things, and we can talk about exclusion. I'm really concerned about what's happening to our children in California and the breakdown of the family. And I, I think it's far healthier, and perhaps you can comment on that, that we have differing, differing opinions rather than people walking, walking in lockstep. One party pushed through those laws, and it scares me. I want to divide your question into two things. One is, I don't think it's a good idea to have a one-party state. I, I think it's generally not healthy in our type of system. In parliamentary democracies, they can have a variety of different parties, and that works okay. I've always thought ours is good at having two, but having one, which many states have on one side or the other, is to me not an ideal thing. When I was growing up, California had two parties, two, two strong parties, and then what happened was, uh, Pete Wilson's, I think it was when he was running for his second term, ran ads on immigration that killed it forever. That was, that was, the, the Republican Party just was destroyed by that. And so they have you know, not even one third of the legislature anymore. But aside from that, on the question of, of, of families and marriage, two things, I think. One is uh, on the question of what children are taught. Uh, one of the things we were able to get inserted into the education in the public education code is that parents have an ability to be involved directly in their children's education on these questions, that it falls to parental right. So there's a series of rights, it's up on our website if you want to look at it, the diocese, that parents have to exercise within their public schools regarding their particular kids. So it's meant to be a safeguard. The, th the third thing is, uh, marriage is collapsing partly um, because of, of all, all these things coming together, uh, the relativism, partly poverty. That what's happening is, you, you know, marriage is going in two different directions. Among wealthier, better educated people, marriage is stronger. Among people who are poor or lower middle class and lower education, it's... Well, what I'm saying is that these, are, which are often legally, uh, the great tragedy of marriage now is people aren't getting married. That's the great problem in our society now. They're not only not getting married in the church, they're just not getting married. And this is accelerating in our society, and that's what I think is just a core, core issue. Yes, uh, Your Excellency, um, you kept uh, mentioning Catholic social teaching, yes. uh, but you did not mention the Ten Commandments, okay? Abortion is a torture and murder of an innocent human being, and they are now advocating it right up to birth and beyond. This is intolerable. And if uh, certain people get into power, doctors will be forced to perform abortions or essentially lose their jobs. Now, I wanted to say one thing about climate. It's very important for us to take care of our home planet, but it's not our final destination. We have to worry about bodies, but more importantly, we have to worry about souls. And you, uh, Your Excellency, are the shepherd of souls. And, and I'm certainly worried about souls, but, but the, the point is, if we don't have the planet, we cannot have any human life. It, it, it'll be destroyed. And, and so I, I'm not advocating for the priority of either of those two issues or of the exclusion. I'm just saying they're all compelling issues. And, and, and the pr problem is they're immediate issues. It's not like one of them we can put off and say there won't be a terrible human cost if we put off abortion or there won't be a terrible human cost if we put out climate change. And that's the terrible dilemma we pay. I as a voter had to face this. You as voters have to face this. So. Bishop McElroy, I know you have suggested that the USCCB needs to rewrite its document 
on uh, faithful responsibility, but to date they have chosen not to do so. Yes. And as a Catholic, I'm concerned when I hear that any one issue is preeminent because I believe that all human life is sacred and that you cannot consider yourself to be pro-life when you promote tax cuts for the rich and program cuts for the poor. <laughs> Specifically, I want to point out that currently um, 3.6 million people are going to lose their food stamps in the coming year, including up to 500,000 school children will no longer be eligible for the free lunch program. And that, that's just completely unacceptable. And it's, it's a demonization of the poor. It suggests that somehow they're all these lazy people and they're fraudulent and it's, it's nonsense. So it is complicated, I agree with you. But I think that uh, making one issue preeminent has not played out well for the bishops and their moral authority in the past 40 years. And, and that's, the argument I'm making is that preeminent is not a good category for us in our teaching. We'll take one from over here. Thank you very much for uh, coming and speaking with us. I appreciate that um, you laid out you know, a number of different issues and, it's, and, and they're not all mutually exclusive. Uh, it's, it's not either or, but both and. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question regarding your view on candidates and I, I, it's, it's more of a confusion uh, with me when you said that when it comes down to it, we're really voting for the candidate and not necessarily for the issues. Yeah. Um, in my experience um, in, in business, uh, in, in my professional life, whenever I focus on the goodness of a person rather than their skill sets or their experience, I've always fared better. Meaning that when I've built up a team of, of people that were good and ethical, we, we did a lot better than, than the people who look good on a, on a resume. Um, and so, you know, with the candidates, in, in my view, it's more about all these different issues and not necessarily about the competence of the candidate, although, you know, usually you don't have that, um, you know, dilemma. But I just wanted to get a clarification on, sure. on your statement. No, I think all three of those things, that is, the issues are important. That's why I start with the issues. But that the character, the opportunity, in other words, if the particular office they're running for helps guide you to what issues are important, too. What, is, what falls to that office to do something about? And it differs. The constellation of issues that are relevant to that office differs, okay? And um, how able will this person be to get something done? Because, as, and that's why I said the thing about saints. We could elect saints to public office, but that would not be the best candidates to have. If they are not competent, if they don't develop the opportunity to change the common good, you know, so anyway. And I would just say, I don't disagree with you on Chamberlain, I'm Churchill. But as soon as the war was over, Churchill was voted out because he wasn't the right man for, the pe to, for that period of time afterwards. And so that's why I say, we look at the context, what's needed, what's the person gonna be able to do, what are they good at, what are the issues there? Churchill was magnificent for the war. No, no one could have done what he did. But when it came to the time to the peace, Part of the same character that would make, cause him to be so good in the wartime caused him not to be a good leader afterwards. And so it's hard. It's a, right. Over here. Hi, um, my name is Evan Crawford. I'm an assistant professor in political science here. And I thank you for coming. Sure. Um, 
my question was thinking about all these you know, 10 different issues and, and these criterias and things to be putting together. Um, does, do you have any guidance on, we might all take this in very solemnly, you know, best case, go home, we're, we're doing our research, um, but given the world we're in, we, we get to, and many often do, uh, already kind of know what we want our answer to be, and we're gonna go find that information to confirm that, and, yes. and we might all take our checklist and go to wildly different places yes. to find what we want to make sure and feel good about ourselves and that we're doing what, you, yeah. what you've kind of implored us. Uh, do you have any guidance on sure. that? Sure, I have two simple guidance. I'm glad you asked that question, because what this is in moral theology in general. What is the great enemy of conscience? It's rationalization. That we convince ourselves, this isn't just in voting, we convince ourselves that what we want to do is the right thing to do. It's the truth throughout our moral lives, you know? I remember when I was a kid, I would, this is before they had these bracelets that said all that. I, I would like talk to my mother about something and I was gonna do and uh, uh, if it was something that I wanted to do and, and I'd know it wasn't exactly the best thing to do but I'd convinced myself it was, my mother had this awful question she would ask. She'd say, what would Jesus do? And I didn't always know what Jesus would do, but I knew it was darn well not what I was intending to do. <laughs> so, so but, but I would say this uh, is a simple shorthand to all of this talk. What I would say to you is this. When you sit down with your ballot, pretend Jesus is sitting beside you, watching what you do. Jesus isn't going to tell you what candidate to vote for. Okay, Jesus isn't going to do these policy trade-offs for you. But it will help you have a sense of integrity to what you're doing. That when you're doing it, you're trying to do it as a disciple. And that's all we can do in these complicated things. I'm tempted to finish on that because that was so wonderful. But Dr. Byrne says we have time for one more question on each side. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, speaking today. And um, my name is Justin. And I had a question. So I know how you discussed how you don't think that one issue should have precedent over the other. But I thought of um, Laudato Si, which I read in my class last semester. And I was thinking about how should the window of opportunity that we have to address an issue have an effect on the precedent that that issue has when we're thinking of our voting. So like, I thought of climate change and there's a lot of evidence saying how like, if we don't do something about it soon, then it'll be too late. Should that have an effect on the precedent we have when we're looking to vote? Yes. It's, it's this, this is the, what I was speaking about on the abortion question. Both of these are immediately pressing issues. That's the problem. If we could, if we could put off climate change for 10 more years and not have the, the risk of tipping point really come into play, and I'd say let's focus on the abortion issue and move on. But we, both these are compelling issues at the present moment. So, and, and what I'm saying about not making one preeminent, in the end, you may be in your voting make it preeminent. My argument is that the church in its teaching should not say one is pre preeminent because that's a discernment you have to make in your conscience. It does not emerge clearly in Catholic teaching that any of these three issues I pointed to are clearly categorically preeminent such that Catholic teaching should say they are preeminent. You have to weigh that. So, you know, the immediacy is gonna weigh on you and the immediacy is gonna weigh on you. And there may be different answers, but that's what faithful citizenship is. We wrestle with these things and we won't all come to the same conclusions. So, thanks Justin. Bishop McElroy, my name is Turner Nevitt, Assistant Professor of Philosophy here. Thank you for coming sure. and uh, for your remarks, which I appreciated. My question is a simple one, and I'll follow it up with a more complex explanation. The question is, why not refuse to choose? Alistair McIntyre, Catholic philosopher, argued in 2004 when Kerry and Bush were running against each other that the polarization of the two parties 
and the way in which they had solidified their positions at two opposite ends of Catholic social teaching meant that uh, Catholics were faced with a false choice between uh, one side of a system or another, both of which are intolerable from the Catholic perspective. So my question is, could, could prudence actually say, I shouldn't vote this time or next time, as long as the system continues to present the false choice? Why not vote to reject that false choice and the system as it is and not vote? Um. I'll say what I think is a practical rejoinder. It's, it's not going to be a philosophical rejoinder to that, because people can conclude that. You know, people can conclude the system is not workable and and the differences are indiscernible. Um, I come at it differently and, and say, you know, I don't think society's ever better off when good men or women don't do nothing or don't participate. And so I, I just think as a general rule that. At the same time, I agree. You know, the number of times I've I had my first election when I was 18, and the number of elections where I felt enthusiastic about who I was voting for as opposed to who I was voting against, there weren't a lot of them, you know? How many of you feel that way when you're voting? Is, is, this, is, this is the problem. That doesn't mean we, don't, we, we shouldn't vote, though. Now, it's not good that I feel more enthusiastic about who I'm voting against. That isn't a great thing, but it, it is the reality. But we generally, there's not, I'll tell you, I had a very interesting experience, oh, maybe three years ago. There was a, a, a colloquium in Washington at Georgetown, and I was asked to kind of talk about the Catholic social teaching of it. But there were four uh, public officials two Democrats, two Republicans, who had lost their political positions because they had taken a stance out of faith, Catholic faith, that was in contrast with their party position. There were two women who were pro-life Democrats who had taken the position in favor of, of anti-abortion legislation, in favor of uh, unborn life. And uh, then there was, uh, uh, there was uh, Michael Steele, who was the lieutenant governor of uh, uh, Maryland at the time. He was the head of the Republican Party then. Uh, he's still on as a commentator, but he, he had, his was over death penalty. But the most interesting one was uh, there was a, a congressman from North Carolina. I'm forgetting his name. He was a congressman. His father was a congressman. And so... Um, he, he'd been in this position forever. He was unassailable. And it was the time of the Iraq War. And he voted in favor of the Iraq War. He was on the Armed Services Committee. He was a Republican. And so if he hadn't, it would have been very problematic. So he uh, went about a year and a half into the war. One of, somebody, a sergeant, was killed in his, one of his constituents. So he went down for the funeral. And uh, he tells the story at this event. And he said, uh, the widow came up to me, a little kid, and said, assure me that my husband's life was lost in a cause that will make a difference for good. And he said he just broke down and started crying because he realized that moment that's not what this war was going to turn out to be. And so... He, what was so fascinating about this guy, who was kind of a tough guy, so he came back the next day and gave a speech against the war, and he was tossed off the uh, Armed Services Committee and everything. His constituents still reelected him, but he was tossed off every, every committee. But when he's giving it, he has a picture up at the podium at this event of, of this sergeant, a big picture, and uh, the sergeant who had died. And he said, I take this picture whenever I speak on this question. And he, and he says, uh, he doesn't say to remind me of how I did the right thing, which is what most of us would do. He said, I take it as a public reminder to myself and everyone else of how I betrayed my conscience in voting for this war when I knew it wasn't the right thing. 
That's a powerful, it was, you can imagine how powerful that is. He died not too long ago. But we don't have that anymore. That, that is a huge problem. That's a loss in our society. But there are still some left of it, but, but that's a great loss. And so I just think we need to encourage people to not become disaffected and give up, but to actually stand up and take risks. One of the problems, uh, you know, is the question came up about one party, which I agree with, I don't think it's healthy. But in our country, people don't resign on principle. They don't. Nobody does it, nobody gives up their own. In many countries, in England, people will resign on principle. They'll say, I did something wrong here, thus I'm resigning, I have to or I can't go along with this. We don't have that tradition. And we really need principle to be more work. But part of that is I just think people, disengaging I think is not gonna help us get better on this. Well, that was, Bishop, that was our last question, Bishop. So I wanna thank you very much for coming to the University of San Diego and we hope this is an ongoing discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always good to be here. Thank you all for coming.